Hi, I'm Chuck Renslow, and I'm so glad you invited me to be your keynote speaker. Unfortunately, I just couldn't make it. My health wouldn't allow it. The spirit was willing, but the doctor says my body couldn't make it. However, we're going to do it by recording, so at least you'll have some information. In 1959, we knew, I knew in Chicago, four other BDS, and we didn't call it that at the time, men. That was it. So we decided, well, we're going to go to the gay bar, all dressed up in leather, and uh, see if we could get a thing. Well, the first place we went to was called Omar's. It was a, a cafeteria in the daytime and a gay bar at night. Well, we were there about two weeks. And the owner came up and says, you're scaring my patrons and all this stuff. Please leave. Then we went to a place called the Lane Hotel. That was great. We were there a month. And then they came in and said, well, you better move. I said, why? We're going to tear the building down. <laughs> so we went to a place. And, uh, it was called the Hi Ho. And we were there almost three, four months. We got a fairly good crowd. We got up to about 25, 30 people on a Saturday night. But... The woman that owned it, who was very nice to us, sold the place. And the new owner said, leave. <laughs> so we had no choice. Now, a friend of mine told me about a bar on uh, Clark, just off a of division, that had six people in it on a Saturday night. So I ran over there and I talked to the nice, very really nice man, an Italian gentleman. And he said, oh yeah, come on in, we'll be glad. After we were there for about a month, he says, why don't you manage the place so I don't have to come down here? I said, great, yes. Okay, in 1960, he died. His son came down and says, why don't you buy this place? I don't want it. So we bought it. And thus was born the Gold Coast. The name on the corporate records was the Gold Coast Show Lounge. We dropped Show Lounge and kept Gold Coast. Had a 43-year run after that. Well, at the same time, I was running a portrait studio. I hated it. I mean, it was just the, the straw that sort of broke the camel's back. A guy came in and he looked at the proofs and he said, you didn't make me beautiful. I thought in my mind, I'm a photographer, not a, uh, a, a surgeon. So that, I, that just did it. I wanted out of there. But I started to thought, maybe I'll try taking the physique. I saw all these pictures in the magazines. So I started it. And it was very, very successful. And that's how Chris Studio was born. That was in 1954. In order to get models and everything for, the, for Chris Studio, I joined the AAU, Amateur Athletic Union, as a volunteer. They put me in charge of the physique contest to Mr. Chicago and Mr. Illinois. I thought they were so successful, they filled up the auditorium in the YMCA. And I thought, hmm, let me think. So I got the idea, I want to have a Mr. Gold Coast. And I did. But it was so successful in the second year, we had people standing out on the street trying to get in. So as Tom said to me, well, we, we can't have it here, we got to move it somewhere. And I said, yeah, I don't know where. We can't call it Mr. Gold Coast if it ain't here. And uh, we agreed, so we sat down and battered around. Finally, we came out with International Mr. Leather. In the first International Mr. Leather, we had 400 attendees. Just to give an example, this year we have 60 contestants, and I expect five to 6,000 people to pass through our door. I was three times on the board of directors of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. I was their representative to ILGA, International Gay and Lesbian Association, which took me to Budapest, uh, Switzerland, the Philippines, all over wherever they held their contest. And that was extremely interesting. They have done wonders for gay rights, that organization. At the same time now, see, i got to digress a little bit on all this because a lot of things are happening at the same time. Anyway, Jane Byrne became elected our mayor. I own Gay Life newspaper. I inherited it. But anyway, 
I wanted an interview with her. So I called up and asked for an appointment. They said, we'll get back to you. Well, after that happened about three weeks, and get back to me, and they never did. I thought, well, I got to do something. How can I see her? So I got the idea. I called up her husband. He was a reporter, Jay Mullins, for the Daily News. And I said to him, Jay, I want to take you to dinner, after lunch. And uh, he said, why? I said, I want to get to your wife. He laughed and said, who's paying for the lunch? I said, I will. So we had lunch at a place called Mayor, Mayor's Row. It was right across from City Hall. After we had a nice conversation with him. After that, we got up, we go across. The, he, by the way, he paid for the lunch. We crossed the street, went right into City Hall. He asked the, uh, the girl sitting at the desk out there, is she alone? And she said, yes. He walked right in, introduced me to Mayor, and she was just wonderful. And I said, well, I'd like to have an interview. And she said, well, let's see. And she consulted her books and stuff. And she said, how about next week in such and such a time? I'll give you a half hour. Wonderful. So I went the following week, and I took Steve Kulicki with me. He was my reporter, you know. And in the middle of the interview, I said, Mayor Byrne, would you issue a statement forbidding discrimination of gay people and hiring of city employment? And she said, yes. Kind of surprised me. I expected a political answer. You know, we'll take it under consideration. But she said, yes. And I said, when? She said, next month is Gay Pride Month. We'll put it for Gay Pride Month. She did issue it. And not only that, she wrote in the Gay Pride Parade. Now, a couple months later, I got a brainstorm. <laughs> and I went downtown and I said, if I could see her again. And she says, yeah, go on in the office. Well, I said, why don't you issue executive order that any per, any company that's doing business with the city of Chicago must have a non-discrimination clause. She said, what a wonderful idea. I'll do it right away. Well, when Dom died, I inherited all of his artwork and it was tremendous amount. He was very prolific. I contacted the museums in San Francisco and in New York, and both of them said, oh, yeah, we'd like to have it. We'll pick out some pieces for the permanent exhibit, and the rest will sell or give to a like organization. I don't know if I could want to sell I'd sell it myself. So I thought, well, I'm going to set a, make up a foundation. So not knowing anything how to set something up like that, I talked to a friend of mine, Tony DeBla, because I knew that he used to work for the Field Museum. Anyway, Tony de Blas said, no, you don't want a foundation. They don't last. What you want with a museum. Well, anyway, after our long conversation, the Leather Archives and Museum was born. And today, and this year, we're going to celebrate its 25th anniversary. And that'll be from September 16th to 18th. And I hope a lot of you people can make it, because I think it'll be great. It's your museum. By the way, send minutes and notes of your meetings down here up there. We want them. Thank you very, very much again for the invitation. You know why they wear leather, don't you? Why? Hmm. Chiffon wrinkles.